You don't want to start? Come on. I Liz. never know. Come you on, know how you on, always on, start. No, no, I want to no, Liz, I refuse. I'm going on silent strike. <laughs> Speak. Okay. Yes. Part three today happening. Long awaited. See, my intros suck. I can't. That I don't wasn't, even know. What, that was barely English. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let's, let's, let's let, uh, I'm taking my shirt off for this. Uh, no, we're video chatting. Don't take your shirt off. Uh, how do you like that? Look, make me full screen. So, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to part three. I know many of you have been asking. Many of you have been emailing Patreon messaging, which I just realized was a thing. So I'm sorry that there's many hundreds in there. Just send us an email or something. Sorry. Uh, and asking us, where's part three? Well, uh, we have it. In fact, we have it right now. That was good. That was so much better. Okay. So, well, I was waiting for you to jump in. I'm looking at your face and I can see that I was you're not taking doing a it. screenshot of you not rub, you rubbing oh, yourself. Fucking, no, dude, I'm rubbing the ingrown hair because it itches, <laughs> dude. I'm not, these aren't my, my nipples are right here. Here, you can see them. I'll put it as close to the camera no, as possible. No, I'm fine. I don't need to see those. Oh, you're fine now that you saw them. <laughs> Yeah, I am. I got a hairy chest. I want to say that. And Liz is Liz is captivated by it right now. Um, we are. I'm so excited. This is. This I'm is so be, excited. This I'm is going a long full, one. I mean, you know, this is my shit. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. my tin. This is uh, this is where I shine from all the tinfoil that I am wearing on my head. So I want to be clear that 9/11 was an occult blood ritual uh, <laughs> done by various demons and and uh, goblins, um, which I mean in a normal way, uh, in order to summon the ultimate power, which was the ability to invade Iraq. Mm. Yeah, I okay, so we have a really extra long, extra special episode interview here with our mm -hmm. with our friend Ben, um, who's coming back to mansplain all the different all the things that went awry on the day of 9-11. And I hope that we're gonna include some links with the episode, but I hope that you guys, you know, truthers get a bad rap. The truther community gets a bad rap. And if you're not, if you have never perhaps entertained some of these ideas, like, you know, open your third eye, keep your mind open, because I don't think we're talking quackery. Like, and this is all very reasonable, understandable stuff. I, I just want to say, like, think of who is telling you to think of, like, people who question the official 9-11 story as, as, as wackos. And then also think, like, if you're listening to this podcast... And then you've pretty much already accepted that there was a giant uh, pedophile ring being run by like <laughs> some of the most famous and powerful people in the world. Um, I think you should maybe be like, yeah, I think these people are also capable of, of flying some planes into some buildings so that they could get everything they ever wanted. And had been planning since the 80s. Exactly. So I, I just want to say, keep it. I mean, I, I, as you guys know that I'm the most dogmatic man in history, but I, even I'm saying here, keep an open mind. Yeah. So also you got plenty of time on your hands now with quarantine and it sounds to me like it's the perfect time to get into if there was ever truthers, truthers, if, there was, if there was ever a time to watch a four and a half hour documentary about how 9-11 was an inside job. That time is now. <laughs> so without further ado, let's I was get the show to on the that. road. Really? All right. Well, let's intro. Wait, wait, Liz, Liz, Liz. Oh, I'm we have so to introduce excited. ourselves. We have to okay. introduce ourselves. My name is Paul Wolfowitz. No relation. No, my name is Brace Belden. I'm joined here by Liz. That's and me. Of, and of course, uh, of course, we are we are produced by Muhammad Ott. I mean, excuse me, Young Chomsky. <laughs> uh, and this is True Anon. And this is nine Bush did 9-11, part three. I'll see you next fall at another gun show. I'll call the day before, like usual, but I. I 
Well, welcome to the long-awaited part three, excuse me, tower three <laughs> episode of the True Anon 9-11 uh, uh, Fandango. I should have thought of a better word for that before I started that sentence. Uh, with with our, our guest, Mr. Ben. Ben, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you guys? I'm good. How's quarantine? Quarantine's quarantine's going all right, you know. It, the days are, are blending together, but it's it's all right, you know. I've been enjoying your uh, your your nature videos. Yes. I've been yeah. There's a great path behind. There's lots of turkeys and deer around. It's great. I I'm, saw the I'm deer. The deer it. you posted were looking very. They're looking very handsome. Oh yeah, and they're doing great. Very fast <laughs> turkey as well. That video was astounding. Are yeah. you, have you gone full prepper? Oh, our whole house is every possible space is full of canned beans and uh, paper products. Yeah, it's we're we're fully prepped. Love awesome. It. I would expect nothing less. Uh, so you know, I, I I think you know why we called you here today, Ben. Yes. We need to talk about some of your friends. <laughs> My co- well, we're not friends. We're colleagues. <laughs> colleagues, colleagues, excuse <laughs> Co-workers. me. Yeah. yeah. So we get on Zoom calls together once in a yeah. while. Beyond that, there's no drinks or anything. Do you yeah. think, actually, side note, do you think they're doing Zoom calls? Do you think they're in quarantine? I think I think they're FaceTiming. I think they got that end-to-end encryption, you know? Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. true. I actually have, we talked about this on our last episode, but I have wondered how, like, Kissinger, because he's so old, like, I wonder what his sort of, like, quarantine routine is. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure he's got a bunch of manservants in there uh, lifting them up and, and moving them around. Half of the people that we're about to talk about in this episode will be buried with their slaves and servants <laughs> who will serve them in the afterlife. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, yeah. Wait, so where are we, we left off in our series, it was a little while ago. So we had kind of like talked about the prelude to 9-11 being about 40 years of U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> um, to kind of like position the actual events of 9-11. I think you put it this way when it was such a great way to think of it, like as a continuation rather than interruption. Right. But we never, and then, and then we kind of went into the anthrax attacks because that was a real, that's a really important story for people to understand that kind of doesn't get told enough in this, as we kind of get into the story. But Today, we're talking about the main event, mm-hmm. which is the actual, you know, the, the show that everyone kind of came to see, I guess. The actual events of, of September 11th, yep. 2001, in case you forgot, but you didn't. And, that's the rule. And much like, a, much like the stage plays of yore, I think we should go down a little cast of characters first, for, mm. at least on, the, on, on a certain level. Uh, to see kind of where everybody was that day, right? Because I think many people remember George Bush famously was reading a uh, a book to some school children uh, <laughs> when a when a one of his humble aides whispered in his ear and uh, alerted him that that uh, that the plan was working. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what was the book called? I forgot. It was. Um... Isn't it like something about a goat? Oh yeah, a goat or a pig or animal related. I can't remember. It was like a, to a lovely bunch of school children mm-hmm. in Sarasota, Florida. Um, but surprisingly few people were in the White House that day, right? I mean, it seems like basically no one. It's funny. Actually, Neil Bush, George Bush's brother, and his father uh, were, were, were both staying in the White House, but very few other people were, I think except for uh, supposedly Cheney and Condoleezza Rice. But basically everyone else was gone. Colin Powell was down in Lima, Peru. Ashcroft was on his way to Milwaukee. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this guy Henry Shelton, was on his way to Hungary for like, a, I think it was a NATO meeting, but the, his trip was actually supposed to culminate in him being knighted by the Queen of England, um, mm. which is, love it. Uh, FEMA director Joe Albo is in uh, Montana, uh, Rumsfeld, of course, uh, well, we'll get to Rumsfeld, but supposedly ensconced in the bosom of the Pentagon. Robert Mueller uh, was preparing his case against Donald Trump in the uh, you know, uh, FBI head. He is in the FBI offices. Yeah, TBT, just in case our listeners forget, Robert Mueller, famed resistance alpha male, man of your dreams, was actually FBI director for the Bush admin. <laughs> 
Uh, and and sweet little Norman Mineta, uh, Secretary <laughs> of Tra- Transportation, was in his office uh, with Richard Clark also in his. And that's that's where we start, right? Cheney had quite a day, guys. Yeah, it's a little confusing what day he had actually, which we'll, which I think we should get into. So yeah, basically, um, you know, one of the things to understand about like, or as we try to kind of piece together an accurate timeline of what happened, which is actually surprisingly complicated. It's like important for us to kind of track where these people were and what they were doing. And kind of like we mentioned, it's really hard to get a read on particularly two people, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, obviously the most trustworthy guys in the admin. Mm -hmm. And if you had listened to, you know, our previous episodes about 9-11, you will remember these guys because they are big figures in also Daddy Bush's admin and have been key power players in Middle East foreign policy for, I don't know, 35, 40 years at this point. Yeah, definitely. I'm going back to Ford. Yeah. So one of the big things is that the there's a couple discrepancies about where exactly Cheney was and how he came to learn about the 9-11 attacks. There's like a, an account that was settled by the commission report. Then there's other versions that his secretaries say. But the general idea is that at some point, right after the first tower gets hit, which I believe is at 9.05 a.m. Somewhere around time? It's like, yeah, I think yep. it's 9.05. 9.03, 9.05, something like that. I think it's at 9.03, yeah. 9.03. I want to get that precise. Because why not? We're, we're or, sorry. This I think the second one was in nine oh three. The first one I think was eight fifty seven. Yeah, eight forty seven. Something like that. Yeah, that sounds right. My bad. So right after the second plane, it's the second plane that hits. He allegedly gets transported out of the White House where he is and to a bunker. Um, can you? Do you want to go into kind of like the different? There's a couple different stories that emerge here and also a little confusing bits about what exactly this bunker is. <laughs> yeah. So there, so the bunker is the PEOC. Uh, it's the, uh, some kind of, I think it's the Presidential Executive Operations Center, something like that. Uh, but the, there, basically there are two different accounts. And the one that the commission went with is that basically after the second plane hit at about 9.03, uh, Cheney is just sort of hanging out in his office, uh, watching, uh, according to him, watching TV. He said he was getting organized to figure out what to do. Uh, and he only got evacuated about half an hour after, at about 9.36. Uh, and in, in the commission report story, that was connected with uh, them being concerned that Flight 93, uh, the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, was headed towards D.C. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that is the story that the commission went with, and then at some point uh, he's you know he's in the tunnel. He takes a call with the president. At some point, probably around nine forty-five, according to the commission story, and then he gets into the bunker at about ten in the morning. Uh, the problem is that there are a bunch of witnesses uh, who say that that's not what happened. Uh, you know, you have Richard Clark, who was the uh, counterterror czar was with Cheney uh, at around the time that the second, the second uh, tower was hit and says that basically immediately when that happened, the Secret Service grabbed him and brought him down to the bunker. Uh, Bush's secretary also says that she saw it, Cheney being brought by Secret Service to the bunker at around that time. Uh, somebody else, I, I can't remember, there was some other witness as well. I feel like she said that he, they were, he was like physically picked up and carried. Yeah. So it was like something yes. you would remember seeing. Totally, totally. That, that, that liter- and then Cheney said that as well. I mean, he, he, and he's waffled on the story as well. Mm, uh, but his, late, by both of his, yeah, his accounts include him being lifted up and, and basically being dragged there. And that's what Richard Clark says he saw as well. Uh, and then our, our man inside, Norman Mineta, mm-hmm. uh, says that Cheney got into the bunker uh, at about, at nine, when Norman Mineta got into the bunker at 9.20 in the morning, Cheney was already there. And Norman uh, Mineta is stuck by that story, too. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the testimony he gave to the commission. It, he was under oath. I mean, you know, he, he 
that's a that's a wide forty minutes is a very wide time frame to be off. Yes. And certainly, obviously, you would remember the vice president being there, uh, particularly given there were multiple orders, including uh, Minetta gave the order for all the planes to to, to be downed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Cheney gave his assent to that order, uh, and that was before ten in the morning. So uh, you know the idea that that. Mineta would have misremembered that. It just doesn't make any sense. It's absurd. Uh, yeah, especially because you can, you know, that order was relayed to other people as well. Right, exactly, exactly. So and, where did the commission get the story? Cheney changed it, and basically, uh, I believe it was in a Newsweek. So he gave the initial, the initial story he gave to Tim Russert, like not long after mm-hmm. uh, the attack, and the second story he gave to Newsweek uh, and it's also what he told the commission that it was much later, that it was you know closer to this nine thirty five ish time frame. Uh, and it seems like he basically just decided to change his story completely. Uh, it's it's I, you know I have my own theories as to why they went with this story, um, but uh, that's what's your that's theory? What well, there's this whole sequence of events where Cheney makes uh, multiple calls mm-hmm. in the tunnel. Um, David Ray Griffin and Peter Del Scott and others think that these were calls uh, that they didn't want other people because there's very extensive notes taken about everything, right? Every right. call that's made, every conversation that happens, there are people who are recording this information, taking notes, writing things down, um, and there's there's information, there's, there's conversations that these people, for a variety of reasons, did not, I think, want other people to hear. So the, I think that the, the confusion comes from Cheney went, or not even the confusion, the, intent, the intentional misrepresentation of what happened comes from Cheney went into the tunnel to have these multiple conversations and then came from the tunnel back into the PEOC. Uh, so, mm-hmm. for example, I think that there was certainly a call between Bush, Rumsfeld, and Cheney at around 945, somewhere mm-hmm. in that time frame, that, that Cheney seems to have taken in the tunnel and then came back into the bunker after that. So you're thinking is he's like, okay, I'm going to duck out for a little bit to make a couple of, uh, let's say, off-the-record calls, come back in, and he couldn't really figure out a way to say that without saying that. And so right. he basically just changed his story to, to something that's unbelievable, but it's also it's difficult to call him on because everyone has a vested interest in not relaying the truth of that. Right, And, of course, he and Bush were never called – to testify to the commission under oath. Yes. And they, you know, so it's, he, he, he didn't stand, he wasn't going to perjure himself if he lied. Yeah. But yes, exactly. I think, I think they, they wanted to obscure the fact that these calls were made uh, outside of the normal communications channels. Uh, for example, there was a, there was a big ongoing um, national military coordinating center, you know, conference call that was mm-hmm. going on where the secretary of defense and Cheney and all these other people were coordinating the air defense response and all the other things that were happening and these calls were occurring, obviously, outside of that uh, communications channel. And that was, an, that was something that the commission did not want to get into, right? They didn't want to have to, be a, have to talk about these conversations. And so just obscuring the fact that they even occurred at all or where Cheney was during these times, I think, was a part of, of covering that part of the, the day up. Well, there's also the question, too, about the shoot-down order. Yes. Yes. Um, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, conflicting accounts around that as well. Right. The question of the, uh, so, and this is again, testimony from Norman Mineta, seemingly the only honest man uh, in the I know he's so time. gentle. I he, like, he's like totally gentle. He seems like he's just like accidentally ended up in this whole boondoggle. <laughs> well, my, I guess my point is that um, the idea that this could have been, so there's all of this, uh, this conversation happened, right? The commission, this conversation bet- that Mineta overheard between this aide and Cheney, the commission admits that this conversation happened. Obviously, Mineta did not remember nothing, right? And he's a senior member of the Bush administration. Um, and this, I think, is part of the whole uh, confusion about when Cheney got to the bunker, because in the commission's version of the story, this conversation was about Flight 93 and not about Flight 77. Mm-hmm. And so right. what, what that allows them to do is to speculate that maybe this order was a shoot-down order rather than a stand-down order. Well, famously, that's what they, that's sort of how it's reported, is that right. he was, you know, there was this sort of tension around a shoot-down order. Right. Around and, a positive shoot-down order. Right, right. 
But if you look at, and, and, that's, and that's based on this conversation happening after 937, after Flight 77 hits the Pentagon. Right, because um, if it happened earlier, it wouldn't have anything to do with 93. Right, it, they didn't know about Flight 93 at that time. Uh, so, but if you take Mineta at his word, and I don't think there's any reason to distrust him, Certainly, certainly, there's more reason to trust him than Cheney, for example. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not possible that they were referencing Flight 93, and there, there's no. It was. It would not be a shoot down order. Uh, it just that wouldn't make sense. Which, of course, that order was not given until uh, at least at least 20 minutes later, shortly before 10, uh, probably during that conversation that Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld had uh, at about 9:45, somewhere in that time frame. So that's the other person that's kind of has a little bit of a weird timeline is Donald Rumsfeld. And he was actually at the Pentagon that day, like we mentioned. Yeah. And, and for Donald Rumsfeld, it was just a regular fucking day. Like he, he basically <laughs> treated it completely normally. Uh, you know, he, he was at a meeting, uh, I think, until about nine o'clock. Uh, and then he gets to his office for his daily CIA briefing. Um, and his briefer had seen, his briefer was a, a CIA officer, a woman named Denny Watson, who had seen the crash happen on TV. The, the crash, obviously when the first plane hit, there was all this confusion about was it an accident. Obviously by the yeah. time the second plane hits, it's clear this is some kind of a, a coordinated event. event. Right, so she obviously is very concerned about this. One she can tells, imagine. She tells Rumsfeld, you know, hey, like, uh, obviously we're not doing this briefing because this thing just happened. And Rumsfeld's like, no, 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 come on, let's let's do the briefing. Uh, you know, she's like on the phone with CIA Operations Center, and they're talking about there's 50 planes unaccounted for. She's talking to Rumsfeld about this. And and Rumsfeld is just like, no, let's go, let's go through the briefing. And they do. Cool um, as a cucumber, that one. Just unshakable. Completely unflappable. And uh, <laughs> it's almost like he he had some kind of idea about what was going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's really funny if you see the video clips of him, like, basically, I mean, there's video of him, like, surveying the Pentagon crash. And he's just, yep. like, walking around like regular Joe, just, like, totally normal, just yeah. like, whoa, look at this. This, not even, like, in shock. No, uh, like, it is, it's really off-putting, even well, just, like, visually. <laughs> To be it's clear, bizarre. he was in the Pentagon, like, just so our listeners understand, he was in the Pentagon when it got hit, Yep. and, like, still was totally fine. Yep. Like, yep. Uh, like wasn't, uh, unflappable. The man's yep. unflappable. Yep. He, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's sitting there, his, this CIA person trying to convince him that this is, that, you know, they need to end this briefing. His senior military advisor is, also comes in and says, hey, like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and then the Pentagon gets hit uh, towards the end of their briefing at, uh, you know, b- about 937. Uh, and he, and by the way, during this time, Condoleezza Rice is trying to get in touch with him. She says that she called his office at about 905. He, he was in his office, so it's unclear why she couldn't get in touch with him. Um, and Maybe he, he just had it on vibrate. Yeah, he just had his phone on <laughs> He silent. left her on red. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and then and then right you know the the Pentagon gets hit Roosevelt leaves his office and immediately books it against the advice of his bodyguard uh, to the mall they they there's nothing on the on the Pentagon mall so they go t- towards like the the because it's like near this uh, there's like this whole parking complex just where the mm-hmm. plane hit and so they go over there and he's literally there's footage of him you know picking up stretchers and it's and yeah it's you, it's incredible it's bizarre it's, it's like this this it's totally this bizarre horrible old like hobgoblin just like running people's oh, no. bodies um yeah, i don't know where <laughs> probably to some kind of collection center um but yeah it's it's crazy because to me so obviously you <sighs> oh, know no. i'm not um i'm not an employee of the u.s government and I, I don't i haven't worked in the pentagon but you would think that a man in his position would would want to be sort of making some calls there right like you you wouldn't just be like all right i'm gonna go pick up there's other people for those tasks right but he stayed out there for a while i mean there's like a good 30 or 40 minutes when he's just out in front of the pentagon picking up bodies and not where you'd think he would be which would try to be sort of in the nerve center you know it's he 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 didn't seem to be in touch with anybody else he's just sort of mia out in front yeah yeah, he's completely missing. But between, so he's is he's out on he's outside of the Pentagon between when the plane hits like nine thirty seven till about right till about ten o'clock. So about twenty minutes, and then even after he comes into the Pentagon, uh, 
which supposedly happened at about 10 o'clock, uh, he doesn't hop on this conference call, this NMCC conference call, until 10.30. There's another 30-minute period where he's just completely unaccounted for, uh, basically AWOL. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it's 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 a little it's a little suspicious. I mean, I, I gotta say, it's it's you'd think that's the thing about nine eleven is that there's so few like minutes to really account for that mm-hmm. it's very yes. strange when someone can't uh, can't account for like a, such a large chunk of time. Yes, yes, yeah. some known unknowns. Isn't that what he would say? Or unknown knowns. Whatever. Make my stupid Rumsfeld joke. <laughs> <laughs> So um, another person that has like a little bit of a funny story here. You mentioned her, um, Brace's ex girlfriend Condoleezza Rice. Listen, no, it was just like a weekend <laughs> fling. It was a lost <laughs> weekend sort of thing. So Condi, it's funny. I was reading about this. Condoleezza Rice says that, of course, the U.S. had no foreknowledge. I think she swore. I think this was in her testimony that she swore that they had no foreknowledge of any kind of attack. That there was no like this was totally unforeseen. But she herself had been warned about a uh, plane attack by jihadists or, you know, whoever. Oh, no, it was. It was specifically by by, by uh, jihadists on the G8 conference that earlier in that year in July. And, in fact, in Genoa, they stationed anti-aircraft guns um, around where the conference was supposed to be because they took the threat so seriously. It's also really funny that there is uh, – this is totally has really not a lot to do with what we're talking about, but the Italian deputy prime minister, when talking about it, says many people were ironic about the Italian secret services and made fun of them. Uh, <laughs> but it turns out they were right. <laughs> um, but she was, it does not seem like she was really on the inside of this. Um, at least as not as much as, as other people, because she does sort of seem to be like the odd man out in some of these. Or am, I, or am I misreading that? No, no, I think that's true. I mean, I think definitely the, the key two, I mean, definitely the two key players were definitely Cheney and Rumsfeld. And it's, it definitely is unclear. Again, she's trying to, you know, the, the, one of the big, as I mentioned, there were these sort of parallel phone calls that were happening. Um, and as an example, like Cheney was sort of not paying attention to this NMCC conference call, which was supposedly the whole coordinating conference yeah. call to coordinate the response and he's not really paying him much attention and right rice is a, a huge part of that so there's like the official response uh which is rice and and richard clark and other people like that uh and who knows what they were whether they were you know playing these unwitting you know parts in this whole thing or whether they knew about it and they were just sort of you know play acting that they had no clue what was going on and then yes there's the other side of it which is these parallel calls that were happening on these alternative uh, communications networks. And it seems like Rice was not a part of those parallel calls. She was sort of on the official response. Uh, and again, like, like I mentioned, she tries to get a hold of Rumsfeld. She tries to get a hold of a whole lot of people. Uh, and as you, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of people were just out of the country, not available for a variety of reasons. And so she doesn't have a whole lot of luck. Well, speaking of people who are out of, let's say, out of Washington, uh, let's get to everybody's favorite bumbling idiot who is too stupid to have ever planned anything. And it's just a Texas good old boy who, uh, you know, just didn't see it coming. George Bush. George Bush famously not in town that day. He was in Florida. Yeah, he was he was in Florida making sure that uh, our children is learning. Mm-hmm. And yes, yeah, yeah, and, and other and, Bushisms. And yeah, and and yeah, he, you know, there's there's again, it's like why is there so much inconsistency? There are multiple different accounts about who told him when the first plane hit, what he thought about that, what his response was. But yeah, he was in Sarasota, Florida. He was touring a school. Uh, I think his motorcade pulled up at around eight forty-five. And there are multiple different accounts. Again, like, did his chief of staff tell him about the first plane hitting? Mm-hmm. You know, did he get a call from Condoleezza Rice? Like, it, it's unclear who told him. Uh, and then, right, he's he's sitting in the classroom reading a book about goats or something or other when his chief of staff comes up and tells him about the second plane hitting, uh, which is supposedly when he became aware that it was... Uh, much more than just an accident, which is what everybody had been thinking up until that point. Do you really think they thought it was an accident? Okay, like... Planner, you know, people planning stuff aside or perhaps having, you know, foreknowledge or whatever. I I, I don't know. The idea that a 
commercial plane would just accidentally... Would I can understand a civilian yeah. thinking that. I have a hard time the president of the United States being like, oops. There was so, uh, you know, there wasn't, there were, ex- there have been examples of pretty big planes hitting pretty big buildings. I mean, I can't remember when precisely it was, but there was an example of a, uh, I think it was a B-25 hit the Empire State Building. Yes. Uh, I don't remember what the, the, year precisely that was. Well, that was, was, was that was during the Great Ape incident when when a large <laughs> ape that was taken from his homeland had right. captured a small blonde woman. And so, yeah. <laughs> yes, so the U.S. Army Air Corps. <laughs> So, you know, I think, I think it was not inconceivable to people that a large, I mean, a B-25 is not a, is not a small plane. No, so not I think at it all. Was not, it's not inconceivable to people that it was possible. Obviously, this was a very, you know, 1945 is a very different <laughs> age <laughs> from 2001. Uh, so it's very different circumstances. But I think at first glance to people, to, to many people who were not in the know, I think it's reasonable that it might have appeared to be some kind of bizarre mm. accident. Uh, I think it's I think it's plausible that people actually did think that. Um, and again, part of this is like, what did Bush know? You know, right. he, people were like people were telling him that we're not specifying what kind of plane it was. It 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 you know some people were t- and again there are these different conflicting accounts. But by some of the accounts, they were telling him it was uh, a small plane, or he speculated that it was a small plane. Other people supposedly told him it was a 737, which mm. was a 767, but in any case, a large commercial airliner. So it's not, it's not yeah. clear like, what they thought or what they actually believed was happening. Again, leaving aside the fact that they did plan and execute this intentionally. <laughs> yes, leaving that yes, aside, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, small, aside, that small detail. Leaving that aside, it's not clear what they, uh, what they you know, plausibly could have believed mm-hmm. uh, about what was happening. But yeah, I don't. I don't think it's inconceivable that that uh, at least a lot of people actually did think it was an accident. Uh, obviously, it, you know, by by nine oh three, it's it becomes clear that it's not an accident. But uh, what did what did so what did he do with the rest of his day? Uh well, and again, uh, there's a lot of conflicting <laughs> reports. <laughs> Which is why I ask. Um. So he, you know, so he's obviously when when the second plane hits and he gets told. Um, they are trying to rush him to the airport uh, mm-hmm. in, Sar- in Sarasota where, where they're going to pick up Air Force One. Um, and the, the, again, this is all of this confusion about when exactly did the shootdown order happen? Yeah. When did he have this conversation with... Uh, it, I mean, I, it, there's, all these, there's all these conflicting reports about did he give the shootdown order when he was on the plane? Yes. Which would have been after 10 a.m.? Did he give the shootdown order at an earlier time, which I think is much more likely. I think it probably happened at like 945 while he was in the car. Um, so he basically, they, they, they drive to the airport basically as fast as they and we're, can. We're talking about a positive shootdown order here now. Yes, yes, right, right. That they're going to, that they're going to, any, basically the idea was any, any plane that is not responding to them, uh, they're just going to shoot it down with, with, you know, National Guard F-15s or F-16s. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they, they drive him to the airport, and uh, they basically, the plane sits on the tarmac for, for quite a while. Yeah, I don't remember exactly when the plane takes off, but sometime after 10 a.m. But it, this is after it's, they, they are, they're sit, the plane is sitting on the tarmac, and Bush is in the car. Um, and the, basically, this time period is not really accounted for. And again, I think that it's very likely that they were having this call at 945 um, with Rumsfeld and Cheney, where they were discussing, among other things, uh, this shoot down order, uh, and also some other stuff as well, I think took place on that call. What else do you think took place on that call? Well, this gets into the me sounding like a sovereign citizen. Yeah. I, 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 I want to be clear, Ben. Feel free. Look, <laughs> because of Corona, we're all sovereign citizens now. Oh yeah. Oh baby. We're, we're, yeah. Everybody's a sovereign citizen these days. Um, <laughs> You know, this is so. This is this whole issue of continuity of government, and, and we kind of touched on it. I think the last time that we talked, um, you know, these were these these were these doomsday plans that had initially been put in place for a nuclear war. Reagan changed it to be for any kind of circumstance, um, and then at at this point in time, uh, they start to activate these plans. And what that what this means is bureaucrats going to bunkers. Um, but the big thing is this alternative communications network. Um, so, so uh, you know, one of the people that was involved in continuity of government planning in the 80s was, was Oliver North. 
Mm. Um, and pretty famously during Iran Contra, he used this um, because when you're when you're planning a conspiracy that's illegal, some of the people, like for example, like Iran Contra, some of the people in the government know about it. Some people don't. Mm -hmm. And so if you're communicating over official channels, those things are ostensibly they don't always, but they're ostensibly supposed to go to the archives. Obviously, lots of people can become aware of this information. Some little need... whistleblower could give it to Adam Schiff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that's right. They can put together a dossier. Exactly. Uh, and and so <laughs> North very famously used this COG, um, this continuity of government communication network called Flashpoint, um, to communicate with other conspirators uh, in a way that would not be part of the, the typical channels. Um, and I think that that was a big part of this. Um, so, for example, this call I keep referencing between Bush, Rumsfeld, and Cheney at 945 was likely over one of these alternative communications network. There's a there's a um, an agency called the WHCA, the White House Communications Agency, which is technically part of the military, but it's basically answerable to the White House. Uh, and it's it's a way that the president can communicate directly with people. It's it's mostly run by the Secret Service. Yeah, I was about to say a, that's surprise. Yeah, yeah, we, right. We, we, and it's Secret not a part. We all over that. This this uh, this communications network was was probably used during the JFK assassination by certain people as well. Um, but again, it's, it's a part of having these parallel structures so that certain people in the government can be aware of, of certain things, and you can also have your conspirators who are sharing this information more directly. So, so this I, is what anarchists mean by dual power. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just, uh, you just set up a little a This little is cabal. the government's mutual aid program. Yeah. And I, I, think that that's, I think that that's a big part of this, is yeah. that they were putting into place these plans so that they could... Um, have this alter basically an alternative bureaucracy, uh, like we mentioned John Yu, for example, doing the torture memos, being right. part of that. Um, and so that was, I think, part of what they discussed, that they were going to activate this plan um, that they had. I mean, so Cheney and Roosevelt had been working on this stuff all through the 80s and 90s. They had sat on these planning meetings for this COG stuff. So they were very intimately involved in it. Uh, and when they had the chance to activate it, they they jumped at it. Uh, and I, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is something I just want to pause on because we, we, you know, we mentioned this, I think, in the Maybe it was the first or the second episode. I think it was the, I don't know which one it was. But um, that, like, one of the really, un, like, you know, not well told, uh, you know, part of the story is the fact that, like, all of this leads to what seems like a very well planned out expand, like, very big expansion of executive power. Like, actually pretty unprecedented. And that, like, we are still living in the government that basically, I mean, you kind of say it's like a, you know, it's basically like a shadow bureaucracy that gets, you know, implemented. And that we're still living in this, you know, unitary executive theory that basically gets um, implemented, you know, in the minutes between <laughs> these attacks. Yeah, and it was clearly, it was, you know, A, it was clearly based on stuff that they had been planning for, like I mentioned, Cheney and Rumsfeld yeah. had been planning this COG stuff for a long time. Obviously, the Patriot Act was extremely long, and yet yep. there it was. Mm -hmm. It was ready to go. Um, it was so long that literally, like, barely anyone's read it. Yeah, the people in Congress couldn't read it before they voted on it. They said yeah. as much. Uh, so, it, yes, I think, it's, I think it's quite clear that they had this stuff ready to go, and then they very, very rapidly put it all into place. Um, you know, people, people who are not directly a part of it, because obviously you can't run a huge bureaucracy by conspiracy. You can't do that. You need yes. memos, you need public, it's, a, it is, right. it's in theory a public state, and you do need to have public memos, public laws that administer this stuff. So you need to provide some kind of legal justification for why you're doing what you're doing so that these functionaries will go and do it, uh, even if they're not a part of your, whatever your ulterior motives are. Right. And so that putting this cog stuff into place was, I think, a part of that. It provides a legal justification for, well, hey, we're in this emergency situation. We're going to very quickly write this these executive orders. For example, one declaring a state of emergency, which is still in place and has been signed by Obama and Trump since then. Yes, um, it provides. A Wait, legal can you explain that really quick? Because I don't know if people know that. Yeah, so on, on September 14th, Bush signed an executive order um, that, that placed the United States in a state of emergency uh, as regards, you know, Islamic terrorism. Uh, and that executive order is the, again, it, you need legal justification for these things so that these functionaries will feel comfortable doing it, right? So it's, it has been signed by Obama, and it's been signed by Trump, and it's been re-upped every single year. It's still in effect. Um, 
and it provides a part of the legal basis for all of the stuff that's happened since then. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's no way, I just like, I don't know, I've said this before, but I just want to like, you know, really impress it on people. Like, there is absolutely no way to understand what Trump has done through his administration without understanding what Obama also put in to place during his administration, but really what also, I mean, crucially, what Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld did, like, in these months after and in between, like, September 11th. Like, it's really, I mean... It, it, you know, these, the, this is like, you know, Trump is really a continuation rather than there's nothing abrupt about this man's election and the way that he's governing. This is a direct, direct, like, line straight from what we're talking about, like, right now. Yeah, absolutely. And it, again, it all has its roots, its legal justification, or at least its initial legal justification in this stuff that was done during yeah. these, during these secret calls that took place, you know, literally half an hour after uh, in the case, I mean, 10 minutes after the Pentagon was hit, they were having this conversation. So it's, uh, these executive powers that Trump has and that Obama continued had their, had their roots in these legal, these conversations about activating plans and putting into place legal memorandum that took place, like I said, about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes after the Pentagon was hit. Uh, yeah. It really has its roots, like, immediately after these attacks happened. Yeah, and just uh, one last thing, just before we move on, that I that I want to pinpoint, too, is, as you mentioned, like, if they didn't have these legal memos and these legal justifications, the bureaucracy, like, wouldn't carry this stuff out. And I think that maybe, I don't know, there's, like, a sense that... Um, the law doesn't matter or the state will just do whatever it wants. And like, okay, sure. In a, in, you know, in a theoretical way, but in a practical way, like, no, like this, like the, the United States bureaucracy is fucking massive, like massive. Um, and you know, these, these people like won't, if they don't have a legal memo in front of them, like, yeah, the torture memos were bullshit, but they were memos and they needed that legal justification in order for all of the little Eichmanns to actually carry out what they needed to do. And I think that's like really important to, for people to understand. Yeah. I mean, you can, obviously, I think that there was very clearly a conspiracy that existed outside of the bounds of the public state. Uh, but to get people inside the government to, who are not a part of your conspiracy to do the stuff that you want them to do, which is the whole point of your conspiracy, so that you can make the American government do the stuff that will help out your buddies in the oil industry, mm-hmm. you need to have some kind of public order, some memorandum giving legal justification. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, you know, the law is real. <laughs> the law, the law I, I compels think a lot of these people... people. I think a lot of people think when they hear like 9-11 conspiracy theories, one, one of the, or like, you know, they hear actually about really any sort of quote unquote conspiracy. I mean, they are literal conspiracies, but you know what I mean? Uh, is that they're like, well, it's too many people. It's too big. Like there's no way that many people can keep a secret. But if you have this really just core group of people doing it, that's really not that many people. And I mean, a lot of it is, I think, predicated on like basically being able to predict the actions of others. You know what I mean? Like it's all of this is, 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 it's totally within the realm of reason to, to, to like basically plan for what came after 9 11 um, just by use of this like, you know, alternative sort of state network um, uh, made up of very few people. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, the other part of it is, is compartmentalization, right? M- people in the yeah. military do not ask questions. You give them orders, they don't ask for why you're giving them these orders, they just carry them out. That's true of most people in the in the bureaucracy in the U.S. government. Uh, you, you know, you they don't ask for why you're telling them to do this, and you don't need to tell them why. If you're the president, if you're the secretary of defense, you can give an order, uh, and they will carry out that order as long as they believe it's it's lawful. And even if even if they don't believe it's lawful, so you it's can, funny the the uh, the captain of that aircraft carrier that uh, that had like a big COVID outbreak is getting yes. fired now. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So that yeah, just point the important case. Yeah, you can't you can't do that kind of stuff. You can't do that stuff. Yeah, so it's it's you know if you can have a very small group of people, and and when you have this uh, when you have this government that has no qualms about uh, bombing people, killing people, torturing people in the first place, as long as they're given the order to do that, uh, <laughs> once you're given the order to do it, they'll do it. Mm-hmm. So speaking of the military, I do want to mention really quick before we get into the actual buildings that there were some odd, you know, we had mentioned before with whether you know shoot down 
you know, if there was these orders being given and when, that there was a hard time even finding jets to scramble, basically. There were yeah. there were basically what was called like war games going on scheduled like the day of 9-11. Yes, NORAD was in like some pretty intense ones. Yeah, there was this, there were a number of ones, they were mostly, they were mostly interrelated. They were different parts of the military doing different things, but it was under this uh, NORAD, uh, Vigilant Guardian was the name of the main one. Um, and it was, it was weird because in previous years, they had mostly been carried out uh, in October, November time frame, and this one happened much earlier. Mm. Uh, and there's, there's, some, there's some people who have seen, uh, claim to have seen evidence that this one was scheduled for that same time frame and then was rescheduled to be earlier at some point. Um, that's, that's less clear, but certainly it is the case that, that for some reason this one was held in September as compared to the usual October, November time frame. And like you mentioned, um, there was, so for example, when Flight 11, um, when the, the FAA first made their call to Northeast Air Defense Station, their first question was, is this a drill? Is this part of the exercise or is this real? Oh, yeah. um, and that happens throughout, there's, there's um, you know, if you listen to the FAA recordings uh, and their conversations between uh, the FAA controllers and um, the military, there, there are all of these people who are confused about is, mm-hmm. is what's happening part of the exercise or is it actually real? It's actually, if you do listen to it and I encourage our listeners to like, it is mind blowing, like how much confusion there was and, and like bad communication, like no one, I mean, I guess it's, I, I mean, I, I don't mean in a sense where it's like, okay, this insane attack just happened. Of course there's bad communication, but it's uh-huh. like, it's almost like a joke. Like it sounds like, like a kind of like, imp, like a improv th- game or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, everybody, every, uh, you know, another huge thing that, that you mentioned was that a lot of these planes, uh, uh, you know, usually there are at least some national guard aircraft uh, on standby in, in place to, to intercept because intercepts happen for a variety mm-hmm. of different reasons. Um, you know, it, there had been a, for example, there had been at least several dozen intercepts in the, in the, you know, decade or so leading up to this. So it does have, and an intercept just means that a, that a fighter goes out, meets some plane that's out there for some reason. doesn't mean that they necessarily shoot. Yeah. Down. Um, and in this case, there are, there are numerous instances where, uh, the FAA gets in touch with the, whoever's running the local air defense and they're told that they don't have, they don't have fighters accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, and that- yeah, they have to go pretty far out. They, they start, I mean, it's like they couldn't find one in Ohio. They couldn't right. find ones in like, um, I think they went even further than Ohio, further West than Ohio. Yeah. To, to respond to flight 93, which was, which was, you know, in the obviously crash in Pennsylvania was thereabouts. They were, they were going all the way out. I think to Nebraska was where they finally found jets that could fly over. Now for, Which is you know, insane. That's like totally insane. Right, right. The time, the like kind of like time that that could even, you know, lead to yeah. a response. Yeah. And then, and then even, even the, you know, the, so, so two of the planes that, that did actually make their way, there were two F 15s that were sent out of Otis Air Force Base uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and even those two, it, they, there was so much confusion about where to send them that they basically just ended up sending them over the East River and they just kind of stayed there. Um, yeah, it, it, this was and this was wow. You know, it's not very hard for an F-15 to make it from New York to Washington D.C. That's a pretty short trip for a for a, a high-powered military jet. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, people got to say these are a lot faster than like commercial airliners. Yes. Yeah, and they and they typically, they, you know, they they obviously are not going to fly supersonic on a day-to-day basis. That would yeah. that would be pretty damaging. But in a circumstance like this, they did. I mean, the the ones that flew from Massachusetts to New York. Uh, you know, we're flying several, you know, uh, many, many, many hundreds of miles an hour. Mm. Uh, but right, these two planes from Massachusetts were just hanging out over the East River uh, while flying. When they could have, w- yes, when they absolutely could have been, absolutely would have been at the Pentagon for for a for an F fifteen to intercept a large commercial airliner uh, would have been it would have been no problem. Uh, but they 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 did not get that order. <laughs> There were jets that were scrambled from, from Langley, an Air Force base in Langley, Virginia. Um, and those jets, but, but by the time those jets were in the air, it was it was probably too late. Was yeah, everyone should, like, look at and listen to these tapes. I mean, it really is, like, Keystone government, Keystone cops. It's like, amazing. It, it's so weird hearing these calls. And yeah. it's funny, too, because, 
I mean, every there was like some weird. You mentioned like there was some weird. There's weird communication too, where like he's basically like the guy, um, you know, trying to get these planes is basically told mul- by multiple different people, not just oh we don't have them, but like no, I can't give you any. Right. Right. Which is very weird. Yeah, and that that kind of can so. The idea is that you're supposed to go up the chain. So they, so the planes that were scrambled from Otis, um, there was a direct conversation between the person who was running Boston Control for the FAA uh, and the person in charge of, of uh, Northeast Air Defense, or at least one of their subordinates. So, so a, a regional air defense group in a regional FAA. In theory, and this was, this was the explanation for why these jets were not scrambled as fast as they were, you were supposed to go up the chain. You were supposed to go, the, and the head of the mm. FAA was supposed to get in touch with basically the Secretary of Defense's office to get this authorized. Um, that chain wasn't doing so great on 9-11. No, because key people were not, were not there. A huge, mm-hmm. a huge number of people in very key positions as a part of this chain were uh, either out and they had a subordinate step in on a temporary basis, or for several of them, it was their first day on the job. Like these, yes. are, these are people who, you know, again, multiple key positions in the air defense and in the communication between the FAA and the air defense. A lot of these people were literally on their first day of the job, or they it was not their usual role. They were just you had for goddamn somebody. rookies in there. Yes, <laughs> very. Key. I mean, it's really hilarious. It's like it's really. Uh... Anyone, I mean, it took it's me actually a seeing like a, coincidence. a visualization <laughs> of it. Like someone had made like a little chart and just showed yeah. how many people were out that day and how few of these people actually had somebody that could like sort of step in and act in their role. Yep. Like I, th- I can't remember who it was. I think it was the, it was either, it was, I think it might've been either the hostage guy at FAA or maybe even the FAA chief himself, but somebody in this really highly important role, was out and did not have a replacement. There was no one else who could do his job. Yeah, and yeah. that, like it, that that I mean, these chains of command, especially in situations, you know, in government and and I mean, sort of civil as well, bureaucracy, they're hugely important. You can't just kind of go around them, and so that and, caused massive delays. And again, if if the attack had happened the day before or the day after, these people, at least for the people who who had a stand in, they would have been there, you know, it's, yeah. it's just this one day. It just so happened that it, that it all sort of lined up this way. Uh, and again, I think this was part, you know, pe- there were certain people in certain positions who knew and they, they made this happen and, and ensured that the response would be slowed mm-hmm. uh, by, by just enough, by just enough. And this, that, that actually, that point really makes this sort of like, uh, really kind of puts to rest a lot of the, the concerns people have about like, Oh, well, this is, such a big conspiracy, you know, all these people can't be in it. It's like, they don't all have to be in on it. Like it's, it's, you know, if you are, if you are someone like Cheney or Rumsfeld, you understand that if it's someone's first day on the job, they are, the probabilities are in your favor that they're going to biff it yep. mm-hmm. and that they're going to yep. fuck up and they don't know what to do and they don't have the training. And yep. so it doesn't like, it doesn't need to be, I, I think that's what people got to understand. And that's true with a lot of stuff we talk about. Not everybody has to be in on it. Yep. And, and they're, they're, they plan to for redundancies, right? There were four, yeah. there were four planes that were hijacked, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and th- only three of them hit their targets. If only two of them had hit their targets, or if only one of them had hit their target, it's, exactly. very, it's very likely that the political response would have been basically the same, right? It, it, Precisely. It, so, and again, we don't know what that fourth plane was headed for. It could have been the Capitol. That's what a mm-hmm. lot of people speculate uh, you know, it could have been any other building in Washington. And again, if that fourth plane had hit, I don't think it would have changed things very much, right? I think we would have ended up with basically the same political response. Even if that, even if that small civilian jet that uh, was later said to be an airliner hadn't hit the Pentagon, it'd probably be the same thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> we should talk. I mean, I have questions about the should Pentagon. Should we talk Pentagon real quick? Yeah, let's. How you guys I, feel I was about like, oh, about- I want to get into jet fuel and steel beams, but let's talk about the Pentagon first because yeah. I got some questions about if this actually happened. 
opened the way they, I mean. Liz, are you a no planner? Are you a no planner? <laughs> Liz is, okay, I will, I, say, I will rat Liz out right dude. now. <laughs> I, first of all, I want to be clear. I'm not a no planner, but I'm okay. a, maybe it was not the same. That, I maybe it was a dabbled, different planner. Okay. I have dabbled in no planning. Yeah. I have not committed to the no plane lifestyle. Yeah. But I've been known to partake in some no planing. See, this I, is a, I, this I call is a, Liz a hydroplaner. It means she, when she drinks a little water and gets a little less lightheaded, <laughs> she starts believing there was a plane. Uh huh. Yeah. These see, these are the fault lines inside the nine eleven truth community that people just don't know about. It's it's like uh, <laughs> it's like Tumblr drama, but it's for uh, people who were on BBS forums <laughs> in, in two thousand three. <laughs> They need little emojis to put, like, so we could be like, no plane. No plane. Well, right. Let's just, to say where we stand, we've established Liz is a no planer. I've I'm not a my... no planer. I just like the idea of there not being a plane. Okay. Yeah. Well, Liz Liz is a partial, or she has sentimental feelings. I'm no plane curious. Okay. Well, by the way, what, yeah, okay. Uh, I am, I am a person who thinks that it possibly was a different plane. Yeah. That that's I'm not I'm not casting that that I out like of that theory too. Uh, ben, where are you standing on the plane issue? Yeah, I think it was I think it was definitely a plane. Uh, again, I'm with you, Brace. I don't know if it was the plane that they said it was. Because I don't know if, yeah, that was a pretty that if if it if there was some fancy flying going on there that day. Yes. There well, wait. Let me back up. Flying. Okay. Let's just because I'm sure our listeners don't understand. So we're talking about. The Pentagon crash. But why would people think that there's discrepancy with how the the story's been told? Like, literally just about how the crash happened. Well, right. So the story is that it's Flight, flight 77 that hit. Um, one of the big things for years was the very weird-looking... Uh, surveillance footage from a, uh, this was right near a parking lot. And so there was an entrance to a parking lot that had a camera that was just there for the, for the parking lot, basically to see mm -hmm. who went in and out. Um, and there were frames missing from, the, and there still are frames missing from this video. Um, and so it's very, it, you really cannot make out in this video footage what it is that hit the Pentagon. So that's a big part of it. So we're, we're talking like 15 FPS, 30 FPS. They got to get a it, better NVIDIA card. Not, but even beyond that, actually, there are frames that are, that are missing. My that God. have been taken out. Yes, th that were taken out at some point for some reason. Uh, mm. The chain of custody on the on the uh, video <laughs> footage is like very sketchy. Like it's unclear who had yes. it and when. And like, I love this so much. Not a love it so was much. not a great day for the for chain integrity. <laughs> it really was not. I mean, we haven't even talked about the black boxes being missing, but somehow they found a passport. I mean, like, but but in this case, f but let's focus. On, I guess we should focus on on the Pentagon. So yeah. So there's there's that whole <laughs> issue, and you really can't make out what it is. The second thing is the the. The actual impact site is is not super consistent with a commercial airliner no. hitting a building of that type. Uh, like the the just the way that the entry point and like how that all looks is just very weird. It does not look like you would expect this to look. Um, I mean, it, it it's it's. Like I understand why there are no planers. I totally get it. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, well, also yeah. we should talk about where in the Pentagon it's hit, because it's an area that was also recently retrofitted. Yes, it was an area that was recently basically reinforced to survive uh, not not plane crashes specifically, but like bombs and things mm -hmm. like that. And other <laughs> other most of the rest of the Pentagon did not have this retrofitting. It was like literally mm -hmm. basically this section. This section also had like the budget offices. <laughs> which, yes. Yeah, it had like a bunch of computer servers, didn't it? Isn't it funny? Yes. And accounting. And a lot of accountants were there. I mean, a lot of the people that died were were, were DOD accountants. It's also weird accounts. that they actually mm -hmm. don't have the exact number. I believe of people who died too. That I believe goes up really? and down a little bit. Yeah, well, it goes up and down. I, I, I actually, yeah, no, it is. I was looking at this this morning. <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah, no, I will say on. that there are dis there are discrepancies in the reports of the amount of casualties. Yeah, yeah. So, so I totally get. I totally understand based on the based on the weird video f evidence and the and the weird looking crash site that um, you know. I, it's I totally understand why people think that it could have been a missile. Um, mm. the other thing of course is the, is, the, well, it's sorry, the, go ahead. 
No, I was going to, no, I think we were both leading to the same place because Brace mentioned like how this crash actually happened and the insane flight pattern that this plane allegedly took. Right. Plane in, in quotation marks. Plane, <laughs> yeah, plane in quotation marks. Because the, so the, the plane uh, in quotation marks hit basically exactly parallel to the ground at, at obviously a very low altitude. Because it struck the side of the building. So it basically hit perpendicular to the side of the building. Uh, which is a pretty, uh, that, that involves obviously flying at low altitude in a commercial airliner that is not really built to do that from somebody who is not a good pilot by all accounts. Well, yes, and savvy listeners will remember we spoke about how specifically this pilot, I'm forgetting which, which one it was, but he was um, like notably so bad that the flight school called to try to revoke him having a pilot's license because he was, and the FAA, of course, never got back to the flight school because yeah. he was so, like, demonstrably, like, incapable, like, not capable of flying a plane. Yeah, yeah, this was Hani Hanjour who was, who was training out in Arizona. Yeah, we talked about the fact that, like, his, yeah, and, and of course, the FBI had been looking into him as well and, and didn't mm-hmm. get anywhere with that for, for some reason. Um, <laughs> but the, and the flight path to get to, where he supposedly ended up being at this total, directly parallel to the ground, hitting perpendicular to the side of the building, was this basically perfect corkscrew maneuver. Yeah, like so it you, like I've 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 seen pilots' testimonies about this, and they're like, this is I couldn't do this. It's a, exceedingly difficult because obviously, so if you're I'm making hand gestures which no one can see, but if you're flying at a relatively high altitude and you need to get your plane to a lower altitude uh, while simultaneously being back where you started. Right, so you need to do a you need to do a circle in a two dimensions, and then you simultaneously be, need to be dropping altitude at the same time. So mm-hmm. you need to execute this corkscrew maneuver, which is not an easy thing to pull off uh, in a. Um, if, by the way, completely full of fuel. Right, these these planes. Right. Typically, a, a commercial airliner lands um, not empty, but but n- not super full like this one was. Which yeah. Is the point theoretically was that they were full of fuel, so they would cause a fire. Um, Melt and it was steel a, beams. Right, right, precisely. So this was a, and as you mentioned, like lots of commercial airline pilots have attempted to replicate it, and some of them have been successful, but not mm-hmm. usually on their first try. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to do, and certainly Hani Hanjour was not a good pilot. Uh, right. So mm-hmm. it's and it's, uh, and let's be clear, this was his first try. Right, right. He had never, he had definitely, he had never flown a multi multi engine plane. He had never flown a plane of this type before. Like, this was his first time flying. I mean, yeah. And if any of these guys even flew these planes, which is something we can maybe get into. Yeah, absolutely. To, I to am be very, clear, yeah. th- this plane came in at such, like, you really, I, I, I encourage people listening to look up a visualization of this. because It's, it's so insane. It's astounding. The plane comes in basically, like, upside down <laughs> almost. Yeah. And it's, it's clipping, it's flying so close to the ground. So close yep. to the ground that it is clipping like lamp posts yep. mm-hmm. and like knocking over chain link fences and stuff. Yep. I mean, again, yep. not a great day for links and chains. <laughs> um, but it is like it is something that like it is like a hot shot like Luke Skywalker move, not the move of like a guy who could barely fly a fucking Cessna. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one one thing to plug, I don't endorse all of the conclusions reached by this documentary, but if you look up on YouTube, it gets taken down a bunch, but on YouTube there's a documentary called uh, 9-11 A New Pearl Harbor, and it has all this stuff in it. It's got all the FAA stuff, uh, like recordings. It's got stuff about this uh, flight plan. It's got all this stuff. So it's I would really people, good. Yeah, it's, super, it's like six hours long or something like that. Yeah. But, <laughs> and again, like I don't endorse everything that's in there, but as far as like having the primary evidence, it's it's got some good stuff in there, including this. Yeah, especially for visualization stuff, it's it's yeah. that like yeah. That. I think that yeah, the visualization really helps because it's when you see it laid out, it's completely like nonsensical. Yeah. It doesn't make any. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I will say the one reason I'm like I don't know about the missile thing. I feel like there would have been too many witnesses for it to be a missile, Absolutely. and it would have come from somewhere. Yeah, and it, you know, it flew right over the highway, right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of people, and that's, again, that's why I'm not a no-planer. Like, uh, people would have, um, m- m- there were a lot of witnesses who, who saw a plane of some kind. Again, was it a, was it the commercial airliner that they said it was? Right, was it right, a different right. plane? 
like that, I think is still uncertain, but it, it definitely seems like a plane of some kind. Well, it's also just like, it's clear that the people who did this attack, which by which I mean the, the government officials we mentioned earlier, uh, that they have no like compunctions about hijacking a plane and crashing it into a building. No. So I'm not sure why they would pick a missile for this one. Right, right. I'm yeah. ready for the end So the second plane Hit at 9.02 Saw it live on a hotel TV Talking on my cell with you You said this would happen just like that, it did. Wrong about the feeling, wrong about the sound, but right to say. Um, I feel like before we get into the towers, we do have to mention, like we said, the fourth plane, the Flight 93, which is gets allegedly, which crash lands allegedly. Um, and also becomes the subject of a fine film. It is the Ringo star of the of It is. The that's four so cute. Flights. Everyone forgets 93. Yeah. I guess that's why they made the movie. But um, I don't, you know what's funny is I will say like, even people who are perhaps not as truthed out as we are, don't believe the official story about 93. Like they are, they concede that it was probably shot down, which I think is so funny. Just like normies or people who don't consider themselves um, truthers. Yeah, it definitely, I mean, uh, so there's a lot of there. Obviously there's the shoot down order that was given, yeah. um, which the commission report says happened later. I think probably happened at, at around 945, something like that which is a completely consistent timeline with, with Flight 93 getting shot down. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it totally makes sense that that order would have been out there. Um, I'm not really clear like why it would have been shot down. Um, like, I, I have a couple of theories on that. I'd be curious to hear them because I don't really know. So I think that they saw how smashingly successful they'd been so far. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been extremely suspicious had they not done that. Like I think it was insurance – like I think having a flight mm. hijacked was insurance for if the other three didn't go as planned or if one of the other ones didn't go as planned. But the fact that all three prior ones had had uh, you know it, things things were going well, let's say, um, then it makes sense to me that that this that they 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 might as well just shoot this one down. So it wasn't like I mean one could imagine they would face some some harsh questions uh, about why that did not happen um, if it hadn't. But it also gave people martyrs too. Yeah, yeah. It gave I mean, very... the, martyrs in a different sense than the martyrs, the rest of the victims. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I the other the other thing is that the crash site is just totally bonkers. Mm -hmm. It is like, I mean, basically, when investigators showed up, there was like a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. There, there was no plane. I mean, it was. It, it was just know. like blown to dust, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not. It, it basically just is not consistent with. I mean, you could look at photos yourself, and like the early, like people who were on the scene. Obviously, the NTSB report gets gets massaged, but the people who were on the scene early on, like they, they all, like it just doesn't make any sense. It's like a, a little tiny hole in the ground in the turf uh, that is smoking. So it's it's not. It, you know, either it was not the commercial airliner that crashed or, right, or that it was shot down and, and what was left was this, this, you know, maybe some pieces that, uh, the more intact ones that created this, this wreckage. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's, it's, the, the, for me, I've always thought that there was such a tremendous sort of propaganda effort around that. Like around sort of the the, the fighting back against the um, mm -hmm. the hijackers that that uh, the movie the, to there me, was the phone calls as well yeah remember that's like a, a really important piece is that you get audio of people calling let's in roll. that the plane yeah you've got let's roll but also just like the people calling their families yeah yeah and it's 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 I've always thought that that was that was really useful to 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 sort of to Bush and, and company here because it it basically gives them this like sort of semi not positive but this this sort of kind of uplifting story about these people sacrificing themselves to save whoever would have you know their plane would have hit yep 
Um, yeah, that yeah. makes sense to me. Well, I okay. We've cheesed it long enough. It's time. Let's talk towers. There's two. The twins. So There's first three. of all, yes, that's yes. Right. triplets. <laughs> first of all, what? So what's what are the World Trade Center towers? Like, what's going on in these things? I think a lot of people, you know, you hear nine eleven, you hear the twin towers, but. Uh, what are we talking about here? I mean, a lot of a lot of you know. We talked about like there's uh, our this show's favorite Deutsche Bank uh, mm-hmm. had a lot of offices. There's a lot of it was a lot of finance. War Church, a little Eichmanns uh, inside that building, inside both of those buildings. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a it was a it was owned by the so these buildings were all this whole complex was owned by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, mm-hmm. uh, and it was basically running out as office space. I mean, a, a whole number of downtown finance companies had offices. Uh, in these towers, Deutsche Bank, just mentioned Lehman Brothers, a lot of them, uh, and then World Trade Center Seven. I think we mentioned earlier, but but the CIA had some offices there. Um, it was a Solomon Brothers had a, had a major office in World Trade Center Seven, uh, and that was also the one of New York City's emergency operations centers was also World Trade Center Seven. Uh, so there's a lot going on in these in these three buildings. Uh, and they, they were they were owned, or at least they the offices were leased out, I guess, by a guy named Larry Silverstein. Yes, he had he had just. Per, I don't. I, again, at the two I months before. I don't. Yeah, I don't know the like precisely the ownership structure, like how exactly it works. But basically, he purchased the buildings in yes. essence. And uh, two two months before it happened, uh, Larry Silverstein bought these things. And he took out insurance uh, policies on both buildings as well. Um, so I think the total, I think the total price for World Trade Center one and two that he paid was three billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and he ended up, he ended up getting paid. He tried to claim six billion dollars on the insurance policy. I think it was he, actually seven. Yeah, he, some crazy number because it was two attacks. So he said, "Well, I get double the payout." <laughs> Classic. Uh, the, the the court there was a settlement, and I think he ended up getting something like four and a half billion. Um, but he, I mean. So again, the the planes struck. I can't remember which building his office was in, um, but obviously they they struck at around the time that most people would be showing up. So like eight thirty, eight forty five, nine o'clock, you know that time frame. He he took a meeting in his office every single morning, mm-hmm. but uh, not that morning. But not that morning because his <laughs> wife had scheduled a doctor's appointment for him that he forgot about, and so he was like stuck. I think in midtown traffic at the time. Yeah, he was that going to his happened. dermatologist. I Always say, is the wife. That's I will all, that's say key. Yeah. I, this show has in the past uh, staked out a fairly comprehensive pro nagging position <laughs> vis-a-vis <laughs> wives, etc. Sure. Uh, I gotta say, nagging saves the day again. Yep. Yep. Uh, no, I think he was actually supposed to be either in the meeting or he also had a breakfast date that he yeah. skipped out on. Uh, yeah, and I mean, he like he I, he said himself, he every single day he was in his office at that time, except for this one day. Yeah. Um, you know, for some bizarre reason, he was not there. <laughs> Amazing. So, <laughs> let's talk about. I don't even know where we should begin on this. Well, I mean, do you think jet fuel can melt steel beams? Good question. I think that question has been answered pretty unambiguously. Even NIST admits <laughs> jet fuel cannot <laughs> melt steel beams. That's right. So basically, when the, the so the first plane hits, this is the North Tower, right? Right. And right. that's around eight. 45, 847? Yeah, I think it was 847. I think that was okay. when it, exactly when it hit. And people are already, like, as it's happening, I mean, you know, people are fleeing, but people are already on the ground looking at the damage before the second plane comes, right? Y- yeah, that's right. And, and actually, this is like a, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, out myself already. I'm, I'm definitely a controlled demolition believer. Yes! Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it definitely was. And They call and, them mm-hmm. Benny Squibs. <laughs> That's right. I would love, man. Squibs. I've seen squibs in my nightmares. I mean, that is that is some scary shit. Yeah. But this, um, there, there were there were two independent witnesses in the North Tower, um, or sorry, uh, rather in the in the South Tower, World, World Trade Center Two, mm. um, who both who both heard a massive explosion in the basement, um, and uh, one of them was a, a, an engineer who was working in a sub basement. He hears this huge explosion. He goes upstairs. Uh, I don't call his name exactly. This is all stuff, by the way, pulled from History Commons, which I, I encourage people to check out. They've got mm-hmm. a great, we, will, we will link uh, to it. Yeah, they got a great 9-11 timeline. Um, 
and he's he's down in the sub basement. He goes upstairs, and he he actually both the people I'm going to mention were were uh, witnessed the '93 um, World Trade Center bombing, which was a bomb in the basement, um, mm-hmm. which had its own weird ties to the FBI. But he, and Muhammad uh, Atta, it, <laughs> yeah, and he <laughs> but but he goes up to uh, the floor above him, and this. Uh, in his own words, this this fifty ton hydraulic press that was used to to uh, make parts for for various purposes was just obliterated. It was just gone. And he goes up to the parking garage, and there's huge, huge amounts of damage. Mm. Um, now he, he he doesn't he doesn't his time frame is uncertain. Obviously, not you know most normal people were not keeping track of exactly what time everything happened. Yes. Um, but this kind of damage is not consistent with. Uh, a plane hitting between the 93rd and the 99th floors of the building. It just it just isn't possible to destroy a 50 ton solid metal you know piece of equipment and to cause huge damage uh, without to, whole to, collapse. Absolutely not. Right. It it just doesn't make any sense. A, a second witness, a janitor um, who was who has been hailed as a hero because he was one of the people. He was one of the few people in the North Tower that had a master key, um, and he was unlocking doors for firefighters. He was going up the stairs. Mm. He also heard this explosion. Um, hmm. He heard this explosion happen, and then they, and then he did hear the second explosion. Him and his boss heard the second explosion, which was the plane hitting, um, and the the damage. And and he also has witnessed a coworker of his came into the office that he was in, uh, in one of the sub basement floors, and they, this person was burned quite severely. Um, and burned. again, this was burned. Yes, burned, burned very severely. The hmm. the explanation that NIST gave for this. Uh, was that jet fuel had traveled down the elevator shaft and it was on Hate fire? When that happens, and it caused this, uh, and it caused this, uh, this damage. Uh, that's insane. Is, it doesn't make any sense. the The volume of fuel that's carried on a commercial airliner versus the volume of ninety plus stories of elevator shaft. This is. Uh, it just is. This is the dumbest motherfucking thing I've ever heard in my life. They're telling me that. That jet fuel, flaming jet fuel, traveled <laughs> 90 fucking stories down an elevator shaft and then came out of the elevator shaft like the fucking shining blood and burned this dude. What? That's, that's the dumb, what? It just doesn't make, it it's doesn't make any sense. It's the magic fuel theory. Also, and shouldn't it, it have melted through all the steel beams? Uh, right, exactly. It, it's it's like the double fuel hypothesis, right? That the fuel simultaneously all went down the elevator shaft to cause this damage in the basement, and, but also was was uh, creating enough heat that it was causing the trusses to sag, uh, you know, on those on those ninety ninety some floors. Yes, it just doesn't make any sense. It's not. It, it, I mean, it's just ludicrous. And again, I think this is this is like a part of the evidence for the idea that there were explosives that were somehow planted in this building. At some point. Well, other people start seeing explosions later on, right? Yeah, there's, so, you know, there are tons of, I mean, first off, and you can check, you can look at video footage, there's tons yeah. of explosive mm-hmm. damage in the lobbies of these buildings. Um, and again, the NIST theory is that this jet fuel traveled down the elevator shafts and caused this damage. But it just isn't consistent with that. It's, it's not fire damage. It's, you know, windows blown out. Uh, it, I mean... Multiple firefighters, police officers, uh, people who would know said it looked like a bomb had gone off. Yeah. Um, and it just is not consistent with a plane hitting, you know, again, 90 floors above the ground. It just isn't possible for it to cause that kind of damage on the ground floor. Um, and then, and then bef- right before the buildings are collapsing, uh, you have tons and tons of eyewitnesses reporting hearing uh, explosions. And this was sort of... In both uh, towers. On both towers, absolutely, on both towers. And this was sort of written off as, well, they heard uh, deformation People's of People's memories are un- unreliable. But some of these are people who, uh, you, know, uh, res- you know, respect the truth. These were people who had seen combat in, yeah. in the Gulf War. Some of these veterans who were in the fire, mm-hmm. fire department and police department, I mean, they know what the difference between an explosion uh, and uh, and a deformation. It, it's just it it doesn't sound like the giant booms uh, that these that all of these people report hearing. And I mean, you can hear it yourself if you watch some of that video footage. I mean, it does not when a building collapses. And if you if you've seen footage of well, we, we can get to the fact that these types of buildings also have never collapsed from fire before. <laughs> uh, but that's a separate issue. But like it it doesn't sound like metal deformation. It sounds like 
uh, explosions, and in fact, a series right. of explosions, which is what a lot of people reported here. Well, it would have required. I mean, that's the whole idea: is that it would have required not just one, but like right. a like series of explosions in specific areas in order to. I mean, that's you know, that's the like kind of the the basis of the whole theory. In order for the building to collapse the way that it did, right. And that's so. That's like a really a really important point is. Um, I'm not, so I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I just, I've just read. I am the, though. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, so this is just kind of my like amateur, but um, uh, this, these buildings collapsed at least for part of their collapse at free fall mm-hmm. speed. Mm-hmm. Yes. And this was something that was not in the NIST reports initially. Uh, and actually I think it was like a high school science teacher <laughs> did, <laughs> did some frame by frame analysis of the videos and showed that there was a time, at least some time, when these buildings were collapsing at free fall speed. And NIST was forced to update their report, and they did. And now in the report it says it did collapse at free fall. Um, the issue is, uh, uh, not to get into like a, a high school physics lesson, but if, if the buildings are collapsing under the force of gravity alone, right, which is the theory that NIST gives you, uh, that energy has to go... If the buildings are collapsing at free fall, that means all of the energy from gravity is is causing these buildings to collapse at free fall. But the problem with that is that the buildings are pulverized when they get to the bottom. Right. Yep. You need energy to cause the pulverization to happen. You need energy to cause the deformation of the metal uh, to actually co- result in the damage that you see. So it's not possible for uh, you to simultaneously have this free fall collapse and also have the deformation. Uh, and the the pulverization of of much of the wreckage that you end up seeing. There's just not enough energy uh, to to actually end up causing that. Um, the the second part of it is is I mentioned earlier the squibs. Yeah. Um, so just to really quickly explain what those are, I think a lot of people have seen. I mean, at least in my mind, it, you know, when I was looking at all this stuff, it made total sense because you can, in your memory, when you think of like you know, I think it's like World Trade Center one you see these like kind of like clouds of dust ejecting out of the sides of the building. I mean, it's like kind of ingrained in the photo of the towers. Almost, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and those are what you call squibs, right? Yeah. Those are squibs and squibs are, if you watch footage of a, of a controlled demolition, they're, they're always present. Um, and what it is, is when you, when you want to collapse a building, you, you go to where the, uh, structural parts of the building are the different you know girders and things that are actually holding the thing up, and you need to destroy those, right? So the way that you do that is you place explosives on them, and in the parts of the structure that are in close contact to the to the most energetic phase of the explosion, that is to say, like the parts that are touching the explosive, basically, those parts become pulverized and they get sent out in this cloud of dust. It's sent out at very very high speed. Yeah, um, and in the case of these in the case of these collapses. Um, if you do like a slow mo video footage, you can see it's at least 100 miles an hour that these clouds are ejected. Probably faster than that, um, and it's a pretty telltale sign. And if you if you look at footage, you can see these these little puffs of smoke uh, emerging in in advance of the mm-hmm. sort of advancing uh, supposed pancake collapse of the building. Wait, uh, can you go over the pancake? Because yeah. yeah, that's the official. Yeah, yeah, cook me up, cook me up a flapjack. I mean, just like really, really briefly, like the NIST account of what of what happened, right? Um, yeah. I think it is important to know. So the first thing is that um, prior to this and since this, uh, these are these are steel frame skyscrapers, right? These are very common buildings. And part of the reason that the NIST report happened in the first place was engineers mm-hmm. were like, "What the fuck is this actually possible that all of yeah. these steel skyscrapers that we've been building are this vulnerable to fire?" Like that I mean, that be, they can just like a, a large fire will literally demolish giant skyscrapers because like that's, pulverize it, <laughs> right? Because that's the NIST. The NIST theory is that the is that it wasn't just the jet fuel; it was office. It was things in the office, right? Fire, yeah, papers, uh, cushions, carpeting, just normal stuff that you would have in any office building in this country. So, uh, so uh, very understandably, engineers were very concerned. Like, is this is this something that we haven't been accounting for? So the NIST story for World Trade Center 1 and 2 is that uh, the planes hit. When they hit, they shear off some of the fireproofing from these girders. Uh, and then obviously the, the explosion, the jet fuel, all of the stuff in the office causes this big fire. That fire causes enough heat 
that these girders that are joining the outside wall and the center column melt. They start to sag, and as they sag, they pull the outside wall into the middle. And that triggers this pancake collapse, uh, whereby you know the top floor falls into the second floor, and that's enough force to cause the second floor to fall into the third floor, mm-hmm. or the reverse, you know, the 100 and whatever floor, you know, fall on the 99th floor, etc. That is the theory of, of how the buildings collapsed. Um, problem is it doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's the thing with all this is like, it's, it's, it's so much of it when you like, okay, but well you realize, look on the surface, you don't really understand these concepts, but like once it's laid out, it makes no fucking sense. And, and it's astounding. You know, architect, architects and engineers for nine 11 truth are this group that was founded in 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, these are people who have put their professional credibility on the line. I mean, they are regarded as wackos by a lot of people. Um, but in their professional judgment, and they've done a lot of, there have been a lot of technical papers that have come out. There was a recent one about World Trade Center 7, which is even weirder than World Trade mm-hmm. Center 1 and 2. Um, you know, they've, they've explained, like, it does the NIST explanation does not make any sense. And again, I'm not an engineer, so my, my explanation is, is not the best. But the idea that, um, again, it, when, you have a, when you have a floor crashing into the next floor below it, it doesn't just cause everything to give way. There is a there is a ton of at the very top of a building. Obviously, the 99th floor, the, the stuff that's holding up the 99th floor, is also strong enough to hold up every single floor below. I know it. it doesn't even make sense just thinking through it, like as a you know, yeah, like as a non-engineer, I mean, no, or a non-architect. Absolutely, as a layperson, it doesn't. We've been we've been like fed this all this bullshit by all these groups to make us not trust just very basic. But the idea that one floor falling. 10 feet would be enough force to cause the entire structure below it to just give way. It's, it doesn't make any sense. And it's, I mean, in my opinion, it's clearly not what actually happened. Well, uh, you mentioned the redheaded stepchild, which is building seven. Yeah. Mm. And building seven is really what caused a lot of people. So, I mean, the first, the first thing to know about all of these different reports that happened, like World Trade Center seven does not get mentioned in the nine 11 commission report. Yes. Basically at all. Because Not even in popular imagination. No, no, totally. Right. Two planes brought down three towers. How is that possible, right? Uh, World, it's, Trade- it's, and it, World Trade Center, or excuse me, yeah, WT7 was not a little teeny building no. right next to it either. No, huge. 70, 70 plus, I think it was 78 floors, something like mm-hmm. that. Yep. Um, it was, I was just watching this Daniel Ganser. He's a, he's a, um, a Swiss historian. And he was saying if, if that building had been in Switzerland, it would have been the tallest building in Switzerland, right? It's a very, very big very huge skyscraper. Name. Yeah, people think it's like some random parking no. structure because there were no. the other parking structures that got affected, but sure. it was not, um, yeah, like you said, two planes brought down three buildings. What happened? Right. And so it's, it's kind of funny because initially World Trade Center 7 was not included in the initial NIST report that covered World Trade Center 1 and 2, uh, which is very peculiar. As you mentioned, it's not just sort of an ancillary structure. It's a 70 plus story in in most you know in a lot of cities in this country it would be by far the tallest building right yes it's a a very very big building um and the thing about it is that um and this is actually in like if you go and watch the videos of them reading out the initial NIST report they talk about how the fact that the planes hitting world trade center one and two and shearing off the fireproofing was a necessary element for those buildings coming down In, in the absence of the plane impact uh those buildings don't come down i mean that's that's the conclusion of the NIST report well, no plane hit World Trade Center 7. So what what happened? Why did it come down? Uh, uh, the fireproofing fell off. <laughs> that, I mean, that is basically their explanation, is that it was inadequate fireproofing. Um, and actually, you know, since then they have upped the standards. But I think that that's, I think that that's very clearly uh, bullshit. It doesn't make any sense. The... the um, you know, for a long time, they tried to claim that uh, some of the debris that were that came off of the first two collapses. Yeah, that was the yeah that it was some, like it like started a fire and then it brought down the building. It's yeah, like, what? and again, there was no jet fuel in that building. All that there was was typical office stuff: carpets, you know, cushions on, on desk chairs, papers, that, that that kind of stuff. There was there was no jet fuel. There was nothing else that would have caused a major fire. And again, what that means is if World Trade Center Seven is vulnerable to that kind of thing. Why don't we see, because you have high-rise, huge high-rise fires quite frequently. 
Yeah, there, right. been a, there have been a number since 9-11. There were a number. I remember. Uh, I mean, how Grenfell didn't fall down. Right, precisely. And in, and in Philadelphia, there was that uh, tower in Rotterdam Square that was on fire for an extremely long time. Same stuff, same office stuff. It was never at any risk. And that's part of, I mean, you know, the reason the firefighters were so fine with just going in is they had no expectation that any of these buildings were going to collapse. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't happen typically. Um, so again, if if the explanation for the first two towers falling is that the fireproofing was sheared off, what is the explanation for World Trade Center 7? And the answer is there is none. Um, and there's actually witnesses that talk about perhaps hearing calls for controlled demolition, correct? There were, yeah. So there, and again, it's hard because, it, I mean, two buildings had just come down at this point, right? Right. So World Trade Center 1 and 2 had collapsed. So again, everybody's freaked out. All the firefighters, police officers are all freaked out. Um, they, they certainly were saying that the building was going to come down. Now, who did they hear that from? Why did they think that? It's not clear. Uh, I think it's plausible that they just, I mean, two huge skyscrapers had just collapsed. Anything is Hist- possible at this point. Historical right? materialism. <laughs> <laughs> right. The engine of history. Yeah. Uh, but so so I don't. But that's but certainly yes. There there were pe- people seemed to know beforehand, including firefighters, police officers, that the buildings that the building was going to collapse. Um, the uh, recently, uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks came up with this technical report, um, basically disproving the NIST explanation mm. for how this how this came down, uh, which I encourage people to check out. If you just Google Alaska Fairbanks World Trade Center Seven, you'll you'll find it. Um, and again, I'm not an engineer, but this building also collapsed, at least for part of its collapse, at free fall speed. And mm-hmm. you, can, you can watch the video footage yeah. yourself. The whole, the, the penthouse, there's a penthouse on the very top. Uh, I'm making hand gestures. I don't know why I'm doing that. But there's a penthouse at the top well, of the building. I think people can visualize what top of the building means. There's this, there's this penthouse that collapses initially. And then the entire rest of the top of the building collapses simultaneously. It all collapses at the exact same time. And you can look at this footage with your own eyes. NIST's explanation is that a single column, uh, I think it was column 79, failed. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that that precipitated this chain of failures. Um, that's not consistent with what you see, right? Then you would expect to see a progressive collapse. Part of the building collapses initially. Yes. Right. But again, uh, it's even no, It's case, like seamless. It just, whoop. Straight it down. Just, it just goes straight down. And, it literally and, looks like an actual like controlled demolition. Yeah, it does. Somewhere. And for that, for for a free fall to happen, there has to be no resistance. At least in mm-hmm. some, the, the, all of the all of the angles. At least part of the building is obscured, so you can't tell what's happening in the entire building at the same time. But it, but if any part of the building is collapsing at free fall speed, which it certainly is, the NIST report says that. That means there has to be no resistance. And okay, at least some so, time. I mean, if what we're talking about, it seems, I think everyone, I mean, even like I said, the 93 stuff and even like normal lay people that are not involved in truth or stuff agree that, you know, when you bring up Tower 7, they go, yeah, that was kind of weird, you yeah, know? Is, but the real weird. question then is why did that build, who, why, why would that building need to be ex- de- demolished? Yeah, so there's a lot. I, so I mentioned earlier that there was this emergency operations center was one of the things that was in this tower. Mm-hmm. And I think if you wanted to really hamper the investigation, if you wanted to hamper the coordination, um, basically confuse the situation, that was, that's where you would, one of the things that you would hit, right? You would want to hit this emergency operations center. There's also a CIA office uh, yes. in this building. And which was actually, it's funny because the CIA office, uh, it was not uh, advertised, I suppose, to the public as a CIA office. No. They were pretending to be another federal agency. Yes, yes. <laughs> but they it were... also was like, it was supposedly like the like largest and like a really important CIA station. Well, it's where they, it's where they, it's where they basically conducted, so they say conducted uh, operations to like recruit basically foreign diplomats who were there for the UN. Mm. So, you know, and, uh, you know, Fidel Castro's, you know, secretary or something, <laughs> you know, they try to offer him $500,000. The like 85th to, time they try to kill him with the, by seducing the secretary. Yeah, they're like, just, I don't know, man, just give him HPV or something. It's, <laughs> um, Death yeah. by a thousand cuts. <laughs> yes. Um, 
so that that's I feel like that's a pretty notable thing, right? I mean, absolutely, absolutely. And we we talked we we talked I think last time about some of the financial weirdness mm-hmm. that was also happening. Yeah, we had Solomon um, Brothers in there too. Right, there was a Solomon Brothers, and a lot of their servers and things were located in that building. Um, you know, I mean, it's 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 unclear to me precisely why. What obviously what was hidden in there, we don't know exactly. Right, it was all, but something it was, all, was. It was all destroyed, but something was. Um, and and this building, of course, collapsed. You know, pretty pretty long after it was at least I think at least a half an hour after the second tower collapsed. Um, so it happened quite a quite a bit after. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's I, I, you know not clear to me why this happened, but uh, there that definitely they were trying to conceal something because I don't think obviously most people don't even remember that this building collapsed. Right. I don't think it was for the for the PR purposes that the rest of the operation was essentially. No, and it's funny. I would sometimes I wonder if it, it was not even related. Like it was just to kind of like, well, we're already down there. Might as well just this out while we can. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I say, all these. Anytime you look at this stuff, there's a ton of compartmentalization, and I'm sure somebody got a hint from somebody something was going to go down, and they said, hey, why don't we, you know, why don't we clean up a little they bit? They paid of our a couple dirt. guys to come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, and I mean, this gets into like, how do they do this? Which is like, uh, yeah, you know, how, right. How would they have? How would they have rigged these buildings to blow? I I don't know. You know, I have no idea precisely how they did it. Obviously, all of the evidence was destroyed, and in fact, the steel that was left over from these uh, buildings being collapsed was sent uh, sent over to China, and it was melted down to be reused elsewhere. So I, we don't I, even I, have. My conspiracy theory on that is that's the steel they used to build the Bay Bridge here. <laughs> <laughs> it's that would steel. rule, actually. That would be amazing. They did import the steel. That they just China. like hidden in plain yeah. sight. Yeah, it's part yeah. of it's a uh, it's it's actually it's the Bay Area buying into Belt and Road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So so you know one of the one of the things um, there there is evidence there is some evidence that it was thermite, um, which is a which is a fairly commonly used. Uh, material um, that basically just burns extremely hot. It w- it, you would basically use thermite to um, to like cut a steel girder, which is what these I the have, main structural I, element on these buildings. So I actually girders. have seen it. A I have seen thermite, both homemade thermite and yeah. real, I believe, Russian thermite grenade in real life, and yeah. it is astounding. Like yeah. you can, it's, yeah. I mean, look up videos of this stuff. It is like. It's uh, it makes a lot of sense in this context. I'll say that. Yeah, you can make you can make thermite out of stuff uh, that you you can get at Home Depot. Um, oh, yeah. But the stuff the stuff I think they were working with. So um, de- demolishing buildings uh, and and similar applications that, that these these things are used for mining is a very advanced science. I mean, there's people who yeah. are tr- trying to make better better and better stuff. Um, we talked uh, I think on the first episode about a company called Dresser. Uh, which is a mining and uh, oil services company that has been CIA connected for a very, very long time, connected directly to the Bush family as well. Mm. Uh, and they had patented with a company called Komatsu, which is a um, Japanese heavy industry mining company, uh, this nanothermite. And this is a real, you can, go, you can go look up the patent for this if you want to. It's nanothermite. A, yeah, it's some kind of new, I don't know enough about engineering to understand it, but, um, but this is what people have hypothesized was used mm. because they they uh, right you'd want to work with your buddies you would want to work with your buddies and there's again there's evidence of so people did air quality checks around Ooh. just independent people and found uh part of uh, one constituent component of, of thermite is is aluminum mm. um and so they found like these aluminum oxides that are consistent with uh thermite having been used um the other thing is just that the pile of rubble was extremely hot for an extremely long time, uh, and this was remarked upon by just lay people. Like, why is this? So why is hot? this still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like smoking, kind of. Right, and and to the point of people seeing molten metal mm-hmm. um, uh, pu- when they would pull girders out, they would be uh, extremely hot. Again, that wouldn't have come from jet fuel. I mean, it that just, come, it would not have stayed that hot. I mean, even I know sorry. that, and I don't know but, anything. And I'm talking about, like, we're not talking about, like, out, like, months. Like, right. for months after, it was still extremely hot. Um, and again, that would be consistent with, uh, I mean, th- the way that thermite works is this oxidizing reaction. Like, that would be consistent with this oxidizing reaction still taking place at some level 
um, underneath all of this this pile of rubble. Interesting. Um, and there was really no. Ex- I think uh, I think Pataki was the governor, and they were like uh, this somebody, some naive reporter was asking him like, why is it still so hot? And he didn't have a good answer. And I don't really think anybody really does. It doesn't make sense given what supposedly happened to these buildings. Um, so I don't. Yeah, I don't have a theory about like how they rigged this thing to blow. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, it seems like it could have been thermite, um, and certainly. Uh, a lot of the companies that were pushing the envelope forward on, on making thermite products for mining and, and building demolition purposes uh, had CIA connections, and, right. and those connections went way back. Yeah, yeah, and, and we know that they have, I mean, the CIA itself has certainly has extensive laboratories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. ways to procure this stuff, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we didn't mention one. I mean, we have to wrap up because we can. We could go for like two more hours, but we can't. Also, <laughs> <laughs> we've already gone long. I just want to mention one crazy thing is that they're really, and th- this is just back on the hijackers because this is the stuff where I was like, okay, I don't know anything anymore. Which is, were the hijackers even the pilots of the planes? Yeah. Like, and I mean all of them. There is literally yep. there is photographic evidence of. Muhammad Atta and I can't remember who he was with flying from Portland to uh, Logan Airport, Boston. Mm-hmm. That there is no photographic evidence of any of the other hijackers going through any security. There's like some witnesses that kind of remember, but really like not a lot. And in fact, at Logan, there were no witnesses to them basically going back through security. Um, it's really, and we mentioned that the pilot of, uh, the Pentagon attack, you know, if, if that is what happened, as we mentioned, like that, that would have been a, you know, completely out, out of bounds of his skill set. Like there's just no way it was him or if it was the flight that he was on, but there really is like no proof that these guys were even the guys that were on the flights. (laughs) Yep. piloting these planes and there's not there's not a ton of evidence that it was flight 11 and flight 175 that actually hit the the, the two towers i mean uh very famously somehow the black boxes were destroyed and not recoverable uh but they found these passports that right. somehow made it to the ground and were recovered so that these hijackers jet fuel didn't didn't catch those on fire yeah so- <laughs> I, I know we've talked about this before i think we probably mentioned this a few times just it's such an astounding detail they found the fucking passports of these guys. Yep. I mean, jet fuel was melting guys 90 stories down. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Jet fuel was burning people 90 stories down, but somehow their passports fluttered out. Of the planes, out of their pockets? Well, well again, it's, I mean. It doesn't make any sense. It's so stupid. Pr- presumably, they had their passports on them, or at least they yes. were in their luggage. But if I mean, let's say they're in the pa- they're in the cockpit with their passport on them. The cockpit voice recorder is also in the cockpit, <laughs> right? <laughs> or right near the cockpit. But that was destroyed completely, and somehow these paper documents survived. It just it's it doesn't it doesn't again it does not make any sense. It's well, so absurd. Surely we should be able to find. I mean, where are we should clearly have these black boxes, right? right? I, I, I mean. There, it's extraordinarily rare the crash where these things don't survive. I mean, it, well, it, you know, famously, I, my, myself and many of my colleagues have asked, why don't they make the whole plane out of the black box? <laughs> but appears that if that was the case, then they would just lose it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, you know, the I I am I am a uh, I am curious in the idea that it was not these planes at all. That, yeah, that, that just piqued my interest. Do you think that it was? Like different flights, it you know I mean I uh, at, at very least some of the planes had their transponders turned off. Um, at, at which point it's quite easy to pull a switcheroo. I mean you know you just have to. Fly Why would them. their transponders have been turned off? Um, well the I mean I don't it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> I don't for one thing I mean t- these guys did not have. How they even, I mean, look, I mean, leaving aside, like, how they even flew these planes. Like, how did they know how to turn the transponders off in the first place? Like, it's not clear how they would have learned how to do that, how they would have gotten that knowledge. They um, have box cutters, so it's fine. Yeah, they somehow overpowered a, a <laughs> ex-Marine pilot, even though the guy was, like, five, the hijacker was, like, five, the muscle hijacker, so-called. And they like, killed, five, they, killed one of my, they killed one of my colleagues of Israeli Special Forces, too, on Flight 11. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, yes. So the, the idea... 
again, we really don't have a whole lot of evidence. Uh, I mean, the lack of evidence is kind of surprising. You would think that there would be more solid evidence that these people did actually hijack these planes and that the planes that impacted the buildings actually were the planes that were supposedly hijacked. And there just is not a ton. I mean, there is not a ton. And particularly the black boxes being missing and the passports somehow not being missing is, is uh, very, very strange. I don't buy it. I don't buy one word. Eh, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything yeah. else we should mention here? I mean, there's a lot else that we could there's mention. There's like, yeah. I mean, I... could go on forever, but no, I think that does it for me at least. <laughs> well, thank you very much. If you are listening to this podcast and you are still thinking that same old bullshit, that you thought about 9 11 them before, then I invite you to please uh, listen to all three episodes again. <laughs> yeah, over definitely. and over until you agree with us. Uh, but no, we are, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the links to the stuff we talked about. That History Commons yeah. site in particular, I mean, it is extensive. Yeah. And I invite everybody to do your own research on this. Totally. Totally. And like yeah. to actually do it to go in. To you got to a lot of time right responsible. now. Yeah, exactly. Totally. You should try to solve nine eleven. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. I do want to say, like, I uh, I really love having you know having you on Ben to talk about this stuff because, and we heard this from some of our listeners too, is that like everyone thinks that nine eleven truthers are like cranks. Mm -hmm. It's like you're a very well spoken, you know, intelligent person. You're not a crank, if I may say so myself. But like. I mean, I, I don't know. I probably am. But, like, you know, this stuff is, you know, this is, you know, this isn't just crazy people. St like, this. there's so much here that does not add up in any way. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, we, are, we are definitely made to feel like crazy people for questioning the official story. Yeah. And obviously throughout history, the official story has turned out to be bullshit time and time and time again with actual investigation. And there's a ton of there's a ton of stuff uh, that that there's a ton of evidence we do not have. And what would be terrific would be an actual real investigation. Put some of these people like Cheney and Bush on the stand under oath. Mm -hmm. Ask them pointed questions about where were you at this time? What were you doing at this time? That would be great. And and you know I'm not necessarily saying throw these people in jail immediately. At least give them like some kind of tribunal. You know <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and figure out like what really did happen. There there are yeah. so many parts and pieces of this that we don't understand. Um, and and I don't think we will ever. I mean I don't think that was, <laughs> it's ever going to happen. No, it's like JFK. But, you know. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, like, I think too. It's like as we kind of have been trying to lay out with this series, like this event catalyzes or crystallizes so many important, uh, you know, like new developments within the state. Like it yeah. really is just a key moment in, you know, you know, in the last 30, 30 years that you, you know, we can't understand um, American policy without understanding it. And that just furthers you thinking, well, there had to be some reason for all this stuff. To, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I mean, what I've always thought is 9-11, I mean, if they didn't plan 9-11, then these guys are fucking idiots because 9-11 <laughs> gave them every single thing they could have possibly won. 9-11 yeah. was 100% the best thing to ever happen in George W. Bush's life. It's true. Absolutely. And Giuliani's. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. still I traded mean, on that thing. <laughs> I, I, you know. If 9-11 hadn't happened, Giuliani would be in a rest home somewhere. <laughs> but yeah. he gets I mean, to skate by. You know, PNAC, before, they, before the, the PNAC cabal came into power in the 2000 election, they were talking about the stuff that they wanted, this, this new American century, mm -hmm. needed, needed a new Pearl Harbor. That was the language they, need, they said, that yeah. we needed a new Pearl Harbor for these, these things to happen. Uh, and that's, you know, less they than got a year. One. They got exactly that, you know, they got it. Uh, and, Rob, and Robbie Martin has a documentary, I believe, on PNAC that I haven't watched yeah. yet, but... I'm going to. Yeah, um, yeah. But those guys are really, I mean, that is, that is some cold-blooded shit right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Your quarantine beard looks kempt. Uh, thank your you. home looks well lit. Thank you. And, uh, and, and it's always a pleasure having you on. I'm just trying, I'm literally trying to think of excuses of what else we could do with you. 
after this. I know. I was thinking about that, too. I'm sure we can come up. I've got some ideas. I would love to talk. You know, JFK would be another great thing to talk about. But well, there's a lot of, there's we a lot need of JFK like a, people. The thing is, we need a JFK, like, symposium. Oh yeah, totally. totally. Like we need, There's we need like of, all the yeah. heavy hitters on there. But that Absolutely. could be that'd be that'd be a Zoom call. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a really fun live event if like live events could ever happen mm. again. Just mm. us sponsoring a roundtable discussion about JFK or something that could yeah. be cute. Actually, that yeah. that that's got me thinking. Maybe maybe I know. sometime mid next year we can just fly everybody out to a fucking place because and people will come see us and then they'll be treated to five hours discussing the the cowboys versus yankees <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right yeah. well uh ben thank you so much for joining us uh follow him by the way at house trotter uh that's house and then trotter at twitter yeah. and visit my site house trotter.com oh yeah there you go. Uh, hopefully will not be taken down like so many of the other websites. <laughs> Do you know how much I've used the fucking Wayback Machine in the past oh, yeah. week? Oh, yeah. My God. Um, and yeah, and we'll, ho- we'll, we'll hopefully talk to you soon. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Have a good night, guys. See ya. Tell me now I must confess I'm not I'm not sick enough to guess Dance, dance, revolution All we're gonna get Unless it falls apart So I say go Well, I'm convinced uh, well, I'm, I'm, You know what I'm convinced of? Hmm. That, uh, that 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 was a good episode. <laughs> but I'm also convinced that 9-11 was an inside job. And it is, again, we said this at the beginning, we said this all during the episode, but please, please do your own research if you're skeptical. If you have knee-jerk skepticism, uh, well, ask yourself why that knee is a jerking. <laughs> and maybe you're the jerk. Yeah. So, yeah, we're do t- take your time. Check this stuff out. There's lots to read. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, you know, you learned a thing or two. Well, we will see you soon. We will see you, uh, I believe, next episode, actually. <laughs> yeah, real soon. Yeah. Um, I'm Liz. My name is Brace. We're doing music and production by Young Chomsky. And uh, Liz, play us out, baby. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs> Jeff, 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 Jeff,